Okay, final part of uh, this whole section lecture about basic concepts. We saw now the network sanitization process, how this all interconnected protocols. But what are we interested in the end? In the end, it's the quality of a service. So in the end, we want something from the network. I want to watch a video stream. Then uh, the video stream should be of good quality. Uh, what does it mean? So in the end, we also need a certain quality. And how is this defined? So what are the characteristics? We can we quantify our bit delivery service. That, that's our uh, internet. It's also a bit delivery service from end to end. So we need certain parameters. We have to be able to measure them. And there are some technical parameters. We'll discuss them in some more detail. For example, the delay, a jitter, so that's variations of delay, a throughput, good put, certain data rates, etc. But that's the technical part. We also have to look at costs. Yes, we can always try to achieve high quality, but what does it mean? Investment, cost of operation, etc. Then also, if we operate a network and systems, we have to look at reliability, fault tolerance, how stable is the system, availability of the system, and then with terms like five nines. That means the system should be available 99.9999% of the time. These are our five nines. So the system may be not available, let's say, one or two minutes per year. Yeah, but this is what we require, for example, for uh, telecommunication systems. Security, protection, that's also something that's important. So... Can we prevent eavesdropping? What about authentication? What denial of service and all this stuff? So denial of service, thousands of remotely hijacked computers attack a server, for example, by overwhelming artificial service demands. So you, as a legitimate client, cannot be served anymore. So, okay, this all contributes to quality, and there's even a standard a recommendation in the ITU that's uh, E800, that defer, defines the terms of uh, quality of service. In the end, it said that quality of service basically is that what a user experiences. Okay, and this is then mapped down to many of the technical parameters. Let's have a look at some of these more technical parameters. One you should know is latency. So we have the delay the so-called one-way delay, we can measure it. It's uh, the time between T1 on A and the time a message, for example, reaches the other side B. Okay? And also important is the round-trip time. So we measure the time between T1 and T2. And the round-trip time typically should also cover this processing time here, uh, but usually, usually that's not that much compared to the delay due to the transport of your message. Why do we have a delay here? Well, there's a distance, certain distance in whatever kilometers, meters, and we know the speed of light is about 300,000 kilometers per second. So, that's quite high, uh, but it's not infinite. So, we need, let's say, uh, within a nanosecond, nanosecond, that's roughly 30 centimeters. So, it takes some time. If you have copper wires, well, and this is our C, the speed of light. In copper wires, maybe it's only two-thirds of C, etc. So, it takes some time here. Okay, so this is our delay. Sometimes we have fluctuations in the delay. That's called chitter. So we calculate the delays. So we send packets with a certain maybe fixed gap in between. 
And then we check when do they arrive and we check if there is a difference between those arrival times. It fluctuates. That's our chitter and we can easily calculate it. The point is why is chitter quite important? Think of movies generating 24 frames per second. If we simply send them, every second we have to receive 24 frames. Delay is not the problem, okay? Receiving starts a bit later depending on the distance. But if we have chitter, the single frame will arrive a bit later, a bit earlier, a bit later, a bit later, a bit earlier, etc. And this is something you will notice. But playback should be 24 frames per second. So what we have to do is we have to start buffering. That's exactly what all the streaming applications do. They first buffer part of the video stream and then they start playback at a constant speed or constant frame rate. And the big question is, and we'll discuss this several times, what is the optimal buffer size? The higher the chitter, the more buffer you need. But buffering then can also contribute to delays, etc. and waste maybe memory. So there are some problems with this. Okay, especially if you have real-time applications like interactive video. What do you do there? You cannot buffer forever to uh, actually hide the effect of chitter. With more uh, aspects like capacity, the throughput in bits per second. So how many bits per second can we transmit during a certain period of time? Then there's also the term of the good put. Good put, what does it mean? Good put usually is always smaller than throughput. Why? We are not interested in the control overhead. So we learn that we have certain headers in front of the packets. We are not interested in this. We are only interested in the payload. In the end, I want to watch the movie. I'm not interested in all the data that has to be exchanged for this. So the good put is interesting. Then one thing, please do not use the term bandwidth. Many people do this, say, oh, the bandwidth is this and that uh, bit per second. No, we talk about throughput here, not bandwidth. Bandwidth is something we measure in Hertz. That's something if we, for example, have frequency and then we have uh, maybe attenuation here and then we say, okay, a certain characteristic of a medium is that we have low attenuation at a certain bandwidth here. And this bandwidth uh, is now something like whatever, 3 gigahertz or whatever, x gigahertz or something like this. So bandwidth, that has to do something with hertz and channel characteristics, etc. Here we talk about throughput. I know many people talk about bandwidth, the bandwidth of a router and whatever. No, this confuses. Here we talk about throughput and good put. What else? Well, if we send data, and we learned that we have a certain delay, okay? So we have a delay, that means we send bits on their way and they travel here with, let's say, two thirds speed of the light. Then it takes some time until they reach the other side. But that also means we fill this pipe. We fill it so that all wires, fibers, etc., they have a certain storage capacity. And that's the delay throughput product. I know many say delay bandwidth, but no, we have a throughput. Delay throughput product, and that's the storage capacity, and that can be quite a lot. So with very, even with very slow connections, 100 megabit per second and a, a certain delay, you see, oh, that's quite a lot. And this will extremely influence the capabilities, the performance of our protocol. Why? Because imagine there is a, where on the right-hand side, we have a receiver 
with very limited buffers, very low computing capacities. But you send a huge chunk of data to the other side, let's say a megabyte or whatever. So one meg of data. The other side will receive this and in the middle will say, oh, stop, 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 stop. I cannot process the data that fast and send back a stop. Okay, this stop will reach you when everything is already over because the whole packet will be in flight on its way to the other side. You cannot stop anything. But what happens? Oh, I cannot process data that fast. And the right-hand side will simply drop part of the data. So we have to take into account the storage capacity of the transmission lines when we create our protocols, when we communicate. So that will be a uh, major issue talking about this. So how long does it take before the other side reacts? Well, for transatlantic cables, think of you have a delay of, let's say, 100 milliseconds, something like this. You have 10 gig per second throughput. That means one gigabyte is, uh, uh, gigabit is already underway. So that really is a big, big issue. And then finally, we have privacy security. That's also only a short overview. We have separate lectures for security of networking. That's not a focus here, but we will see here and there some aspects. So normally our data flows like this. So we have a data source and we have a destination. What can happen? Well, the simplest one is some passive attacks with eavesdropping. So someone simply listens into our communication. We know what we can do against this so we can encrypt. We also have some active attacks like modifying, like masquerade, like service interruption. So we can do with the help of encryption a lot against this uh, eavesdropping, modifying, masquerading. It helps. So we use cryptographic codes. Uh, we can do authentication, authorization. We have a big problem with service interruption. So denial of service attacks. You can block radio communication, you can cut a wire, uh, so uh, you cannot really do something against this. That's really a big problem. Okay, so some more uh, things to think of. Packet loss rate. What are guarantees for bit delivery service? Is best effort okay? Or do we need something more? Does my communication service really push through all the bits? What is the bit error rate? Is this visible to applications or not? How much does it cost if there are no bit errors or very low bit errors, battery depletion, etc.? So there are some more aspects. So do we go for bit error rates or don't we care about the bit offer uh, error rates because we have an application like video where a simple flip bit is no problem. Oh, but we have money transfer, then a single flip bit is really a problem. So it depends on many, many more aspects. Do we look at packets? Do we look at bit, uh, bits? Is best effort okay? Do we need guarantees or not? So quality of service is really, it's a wide, wide field. And there are many implications. So, well, depending on the requirements, you, maybe you choose a complete different communication architecture. Maybe internet is a complete wrong choice. But be sure, for the majority of communication systems, internet is a very good choice. But what happens if you want to increase the availability of a service? So how can you do this? Maybe, yes, the internet but availability, maybe you have to insert some redundancy. Maybe uh, you insert a kind of a second path for data to flow. Maybe you add a different communication system, not only wire, but in addition wireless. This depends on the application. Or something else, uh, you want to offer an online storage service. 
how should the architecture look like, also in terms of redundancy, but also price. Maybe you subcontract parts of it to some others. What is the reliability? What is the cost? What is the delay? Do you want to place this close to the customer? Maybe that's more expensive. We come close to a term called edge computing. Or you place it further away. That might maybe cheaper, maybe in the north of Norway, because energy is quite cheap there and cooling is for free. Or you place it right next door uh, in the so-called D-slams, the DSL access multiplexer, the great boxes on the road, because then it's pretty close to the customer and the delay is very sub-millisecond. So, well, there might be many different alternatives. And the interesting thing is we can do most of these architectures using internet services, internet protocols, internet architectures, and that's also part of this whole course, how we do this, how we pick the right architecture, the right service, etc. So some final questions and tasks. So think back of course, quality of service. Why do we need it? When is, uh, is it needed? Think of different applications. And then go to the TCP IP model in the context of quality of service. Was this included from the very beginning? Why? Why not? What might be problems? Quality of service and the ideas, uh, pretty much they come from the classical systems of telecommunication and come together with circuit switching and synchronous communication, deterministic multiplexing, so we can guarantee bit rates, we can guarantee delays. Now we do everything over IP, voice over IP. But IP, we just learned, oh, isn't this best effort? How can we provide quality of service? So why can we use these systems nowadays also for telephony? So I know we will not end the discussion, explain everything right here. It's just to start the discussion. I will cover this later in depth, how we can integrate quality of service, if this is a good idea or not. And then finally, we touched security privacy. Now look at the classical TCP IP architecture, what's in there for security, for privacy. How is this problem solved in the context of the internet?